Welcome in. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes here with Linda. <laughs> Welcome in, get comfortable. We're gonna be together for about an hour. So get settled and we'll get started in just a minute. Welcome in, welcome in. We'll start in just a moment. People are coming in quick. Everybody's on time today. <laughs> welcome in, welcome in. We'll get started here very soon as we kind of settle on our numbers here. All right, folks, looks like we're slowing down. So I'm going to start with a little bit of housekeeping. Welcome in. Um, I'm Sam from the San Diego History Center. If you've been here before, you've seen me before um, and you've heard my spiel, but I'm gonna tell you again. We are going to be together for about an hour. Linda's going to be presenting her topic today, Legacies of the Past. Um, and we're pretty excited because this is a new one for us for our San Diego 101 series. So we're happy to have her here for that today. Um, as we uh, hear from Linda, please feel free to use the Q&A function. It should be um, at the bottom of your screen, little talk bubbles that say Q&A. Um, for any questions that come up during the course of Linda's presentation, if you have something you just want to add or comment or connect or share a story, please use the chat. So we'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A for questions and we'll be keeping an eye on the chat for some comments or connections that you want to make or if you want to say hi to someone. Um, please go ahead and use those throughout. We'll have time for as many questions as we can possibly get to in probably 10 or 15 minutes right at the end. Um, so if you want to hold them to the end, great. If you want to pop them in as they come to you, that's great too. Um, we can also ask, answer anything about um, our museums or our operations or our hours or doing research, things like that as well. So if those come to you, feel free to use the Q&A for that too. Um, and as people come on in and get settled, we will start, looks like we can start right about now with Linda. And as I said, legacies of the past. Well, welcome everybody. I'm glad you're here. Um, what you've got on your screen today is just an image to pique your interest about what these legacies of the past might be all about. The talk stems from the time that I spent as a tour guide in San Diego, as well as the many history things that I've done. And I've just noticed these little bits and pieces that I've tried to weave together um, as uh, uh, our ability to talk about things that once were here, might have been here, might be related. So as you walk around parts of San Diego, maybe in the future, you'll be interested in asking some questions about you see, what you see all around you. So first, uh, let's go to maps, because maps are a wonderful historical record. The map that you see on the left is a 1908 map of San Diego. And if you notice smack in the middle, is what was in those days called City Park. And then if you go to the right, the map, which is a little later, it's in the 1930s, and now it's been renamed Balboa Park. So there's lots of little details here, but something that I'd like you to focus on is this sort of weird area, kind of strange area. There's this very angled line, and you can see it as well on the 1930 map, but it's clearer over here. Um, what this represents is the indication of what the city limits were of the Pueblo of, La of San Diego. And the Pueblo of San Diego is what became the earliest parts of our city. So on the other side are the Rancho Mission lands, the lands of the Mission San Diego, but on the left-hand side are the Pueblo lands. So 
Would you like to know the name of the street that creates our city limits and makes the boundary of our city? I just gave you a big hint. That is Boundary Street, and you can still see its name all along the line of the city limits. Now, as you go further south, uh, and you get all the way down into National City, you follow the line all the way down, and then there's a horizontal line that comes across. And the horizontal line divides the Pueblo of San Diego from the Rancho La Nación. And so guess what they named the street there? It divides the two places, so it is called Division Street. So just little tidbits of history um, on the maps. One thing before I change screens, I want you to notice up at the top of the 1908 map, there's like this little blip just overlooking Mission Valley. And we're gonna talk about that later, but this is really the clearest place that you can see it. So when I talk about the blip in a couple of screens, remember you've seen it on an earlier map. Well, here's a, another sort of close up of the 1908 map. And this is the area that I'm talking about here is a real close up here. The star represents the place where I took the image below. So this is Boundary Street. This is North Parkway. You're now looking south. So what's on the right hand side is the city of San Diego. On the left hand side was the area that was undeveloped. Um, then in much, much later years, um, a, an area of San Diego called New San Diego was developed. East San Diego, it was also called. And East San Diego eventually got incorporated into the city of San Diego. So you have some, on the earlier map, some very odd lines of joining up of the streets. And as you walk in that area, you can see some of the odd joinings up. But as you walk in the area today, some of those have been kind of smoothed out and names changed to make for a smooth transition between the city of San Diego and um, the East San Diego community that got incorporated into it. Well, walking along the streets, you may have noticed in your neighborhood and in, or in other places you've been, um, these things that are called sidewalk stamps. And sidewalk stamps are all over the city of San Diego. Um, they come from an, uh, an earlier event where a sidewalk contractor or a concrete contractor contracted with the city of San Diego to build a new jail cell. And he didn't do the mix of the concrete very well. And the result was that a prisoner managed to claw his way out, I think with a spoon or a knife and, and just broke up the concrete and escaped. And so from that point forward, the city of San Diego required concrete contractors to put these stamps. They had to give their name and they had to give when the concrete was laid. That way, making it much easier for the city to track them down in case there are any questions about the, uh, the, the quality of the concrete work. So the first two of them are from um, North Park. This pink one in particular is from a community named Burlingame, which was um, developed with the concept that it was this place that was very special and apart from the rest of the city. And so all of the sidewalks in Burlingame were pink, just to set them apart. Now in later years, the city did some sidewalk work and oh my goodness, they put in standard gray concrete into the pink sidewalks and the people of Burlingame just had a fit. And so now if you go to Burlingame, what you will see is a variety of shades of pink because the city was trying to match the concrete on the sidewalks and the infrastructure in Burlingame to match the historic materials. So here we have Burlingame. We have a couple from the Little Italy area. We have one from the area where that boundary street was located. And then all of the rest of these happen to come from my community where I live, which was developed, can you tell, in the 1960s and 70s. And so this is University City, and these are the sidewalk stamps that you can see up there. Now, um, different cities have different requirements. In fact, it's a state requirement. In the state, what's called the Green Book for contractors who are going to do business in the state, it talks about concrete stamps. In the city of San Diego, White Book for contractors talks about sidewalk stamps. But the city of Del Mar said, oh, no, no, we're not going to put in sidewalk stamps because that's just a way for a contractor to advertise. So you won't find them everywhere, 
um, but you will find them uh, all throughout the city of San Diego. So take a look. Now, you're not going to be looking down for much longer. You're going to be looking out and around you as you walk, looking for signs of San Diego's past. Now, we're going to start with the image in the lower left corner, and this is roughly 1900 or so at a time when lots of things were changing in San Diego, and one of them was that we were starting to dredge the bay and fill in along the original shoreline. So what you're seeing here is actually the, the Santa Fe Railroad tracks and a some tracks out to a, uh, a wharf that uh, are no longer on the shoreline. They're a couple of blocks inland. So we've done a lot of filling in. And one of the areas to focus on as you cross across all these wonderful lumber yards that were here is this little army barracks building. And that's the building pictured above. Now, let me talk about lumber yards for just a moment. You know, San Diego had a, a series of boom periods in the late uh, 1880s was certainly one of them. And one of the problems was that we don't have any trees that produce lumber here. We didn't have lumber yards that were, were you know, processing our native lumber because there just isn't any. So we had to import redwood and oak and maple and other trees from Northern California, Oregon and Washington. They were shipped down here to San Diego um, and lumber yards were built along the bay. And so that's one of the reasons you've got the train lines is that they help to carry the raw log material in and the finished lumber product out. So we had as many as five or six lumber yards that were around San Diego Bay in the earlier years. Now back to the San Diego barracks built um, of lumber, uh, built in 1850, really just after California was admitted to the Union. And the San Diego barracks was an army barracks. This was an outpost of the army where goods and materials were shipped down from San Francisco in order to be dispersed out to various army encampments throughout the Southwest. And how do they move from the army barracks here? Well, if, they, if the recipients were lucky, lucky enough to be on the railroad line, they got them by train. But otherwise they had mule teams that hauled goods out of San Diego to these remote locations where the army at this point was mostly involved in trying to keep peace among the Native Americans. Um, so there was a lot of activity in the 1880s, 90s and the early thousands. So the army barracks was here. Um, it was used on and off, uh, 18, pardon me, 1921 was really the, its historical end point, although it continued to sit in place until 1938 when it was sold to the city of San Diego. They demolished it and made other uses of the land. But this is a historic site because of this early barracks. And so the state of California registered this as a historic landmark, but there's no barracks to put the landmark on. So this apartment complex, which was built in the uh, about 1985 or so when we had another building boom, they needed a place to put the plaque. So it's right here, kind of in an alleyway among some trees and bushes. And so if you go down to Seaport Village and that former police headquarters building that they now call the headquarters, um, you can go across the street and go look at, look for, this plaque, which is buried among the vegetation. So that's another legacy of our past. It's there in plain sight, but you wouldn't dream that it, that there was an army barracks down here at any point in time, unless you read the plaque. Well, this is the a similar image to what I had on the opening slide. This is the Bennington Monument, which is down in uh, the Fort Rosecrans Cemetery down on Point Loma. Uh, the Bennington was an army gunship that was at anchor in San Diego Bay, just a normal day, and all of a sudden one of the boilers exploded, throwing men and material into the bay, burning, just a terrible disaster. Turned out 66 men were killed as a part of this horrible disaster. Um, and so as a monument to their loss, um, this uh, the stone monument was dedicated in the federal cemetery in 1908. Now the event itself was in 1905. In thanks on Thanksgiving Day of 1905, um, this grove of oak trees was planted at um, uh, 26th and oh dear, 
I always draw a blank on this name. It's going to come later. It's just outside of Balboa Park as you go down the hill and up the other side to go into the North Park, South Park community. Um, you cross a street which is named after a World War I Army general, and this is the Bennington Memorial Grove. So there's these 66 oak trees, one for every man killed during the disaster. They were planted. The city didn't do a very good job of maintaining them or looking after them. And by the late 19, pardon me, about 1990, 2000, the grove was not in good shape. You could see these beautiful oak trees amidst all the native vegetation there, but nobody knew what they were all about until a local woman looked into their history and she happened to be somebody who was involved with the local Boy Scout troop as well. So she went to the Boy Scout troop and said, hey, I've got at least one Eagle project that you guys can get involved in. So a couple of different Boy Scouts uh, cleaned out the grove, created, got the funding for and created the new mon monumentation. So today, if you want to go down there, um, uh, you can walk through this beautiful grove of oak trees that are planted as a memorial to the men lost during the Med Bennington disaster. Now, another memorial of that same thing is over on Coronado because one of the bosun mates who was aboard the ship when it blew up was a guy named Willie Cronin. And he was actually blown into the water and he swam right back to the burning ship. And even though he himself was burned, he uh, worked on trying to save as many people as possible to get the people who were down below, help them find a way out so that they could get off the ship. So he put um, a lot of effort into helping save lives. And so Willie Cronin, who was living in Coronado at the time, um, was given a Medal of Honor for his work in saving the people from the Bennington. So today, if you go over to Coronado and you go to the intersections of 6th, Margarita and Pomona. There's a very small triangular park. I think there might be one park bench, this memorial, and a Torrey pine, which is one of the historic trees that they have um, kept in Coronado. Um, so that's all you'll see, but there is this monument to Willie Cronin and his involvement with the saving of the men from the Bennington disaster here in San Diego. Now, speaking of military, we've talked about the Army barracks. We've talked about Willie Cronin, who was um, uh, assigned to that ship that blew up. Um, here in San Diego, we had an Army base that um, is itself a legacy of the past because nothing remains of it except the name. When World War I um, broke out in 1914, the United States did not get involved. Our President Wilson was a pacifist. He did not want to get us involved in a war. And it wasn't until 1917 that finally the United States became involved in World War I. France and Germany had been fighting, pardon me, fighting terrible battles. There were people from San Diego who actually volunteered to fight in the French army so that they could help fight the Germans. Um, there was a, a famous opera singer named Madame Schumann Heink who settled here in San Diego, but she was from Germany. She had one son who served in the German army and the other son who served in the American army. So there were all kinds of different it, it ways of becoming involved in this war. But finally in 1917, President Roosevelt decided that he needed to make, get the Congress to make a declaration of war. And San Diego stepped up right away. Now, part of the reason we stepped up to be home to one of the new military bases was that um, the Chamber of Commerce men in San Diego had already been hard at work in trying to get um, new military installations in San Diego. And they had been very successful with a number of uh, Navy installations. And so we had um, the, the coal um, uh, and, and refueling station on Point Loma. We had a radio station on Point Loma. Um, we had a, an initial um, small military naval hospital as part of the exposition in Balboa Park. Uh, so there were a lot of things that were in the works for the Navy. So when the Army decided that it needed to have these bases in order to recruit the men and train the men who were going to go over to, to France and help with the fighting, San Diego's Chamber of Commerce and, and leaders in the community stepped right up and volunteered land out in today what we call the Kearney Mesa area. It's named after the camp that went out there, but it's actually that area today that is occupied at the Miramar Marine Corps Air Station. So it's just 
um, Highway 52 runs through the middle of what was what once was Camp Kearney. Uh, Camp Kearney was absolutely huge. It was designed to hold 40,000 men and 20,000 mules. Now you have to remember this was World War I. It was not a very technologically advanced war, at least for those of us in the United States. Over in, in Europe, the French and the Germans were fighting with tanks and airplanes were part of the battle. Here, we were more concerned with horses and mules, go figure. But we did build an army base here and it was actually not technically a base, it was known as a cantonment. And what that meant, it was a temporary base and so of the 1,200 buildings that were built, about 800 of them were these tent-like facilities that you see in the image. And so this, each tent had a redwood floor. Guess where the redwood was railroaded in from? You're right, along San Diego Bay. So the redwood floor and then a tent was put up on the top. So this was the housing. There were not closed in barracks except in the army hospital on the base where they had the closed in barracks. Um, but they also had a lot of ancillary buildings that were built that also required wood. So there were uh, places for entertainment for the men. There were mess halls. They were mess halls, enough mess halls so that they could seat 5,000 men at a time in a variety of places around the camp to have their meals. So this was a huge undertaking out in the middle of Camp Kearney. Um, the way you would get there would be to cross the San Diego and go up through what is now the community of Linda Vista, take the road that now is known as Convoy Street, cross the, uh, the uh, canyon and go into Camp Kearney. So a long way to get there, but it was a very popular place for people to go. And in fact, um, it was popular for uh, visitors to go in on weekends. And I think they had a Wednesday afternoon visitation as well. And women would go to visit their boyfriends um, or their, the mothers would go up to visit their sons. And so they had to be very careful about making sure that the women were properly chaperoned. And so within Camp Kearney, they also had what they know, were known as women's buildings. And the idea was that this was a safe place that, that women's reputations would not be ruined for visiting privately with their, uh, especially with their boyfriends up here at Camp Kearney. So Camp Kearney, a cantonment gave the name Kearney Mesa, Kearney Villa, all of that named after Stephen Watts Kearney, an earlier army uh, a person who came to San Diego, but that's where the name came from. So when you look at street signs, sometimes you learn about San Diego history from the street signs. Now, this is an image, this is a wonderful image uh, shared by the Coronado Historical Association. Um, at Camp Kearney, it, was, it had two medical social issues that it needed to be aware of where the men were, were based up there. One was that um, this was the era of prohibition. And so Camp Kearney was a dry base so that men could only drink when they went out on leave. Um, so that was fine. And we know that is a true statement because uh, a friend of mine, Stephen Van Warmer, is a, an archaeologist who was given the job of excavating the base hospital up at Camp Kearney. And what he discovered is that the glass bottles that were in the camp dump were not the kind that housed alcoholic beverages, but rather they were other types of bottles. And so that, that really um, underscores the fact that this was a dry base. The other interesting thing he found at the camp hospital is that he did not find the bottles that were typical of the magic elixirs that would cure everything. And, and they were for sale, they were hawked at fairs and on street corners. And um, it was not scientific medicine. It was just a blending of something that tasted pretty awful, but was supposed to cure a variety of ills. Those bottles were not found at Camp Kearney Hospital as well. So that tells us that they were following scientific medicine and not just the, the you know, fad cures of the day. But back to um, 1938 and, uh, and even into the 20s when we had prohibition, um, there were a variety of ways that people in San Diego and over the border in Mexico created for people to be able to get to alcohol, even though it wasn't legal in the States. Um, over in Mexico, 
we had the uh, the creation of both a horse race track and a hotel uh, in Tijuana. And so people could go across the border, drink all they wanted to drink, then come back, kind of cure their hangovers in San Diego where they could take it easy with not nothing to drink. Um, but so, so there was a way at Caliente Racetrack that they could go and have some fun. The other way that they could have some fun was to go to gambling ships. And these were ships that were moored beyond the three mile limit off the coast of the United States. Beyond the three mile limit was international water, waters and so alcohol could be served. So one of the ships that was moored off the coast of Coronado was a ship called the Monte Carlo. And what the image on the left-hand side shows you is the wreck of the Monte Carlo. It, uh, on uh, New Year's Day, 1936, it broke its moorings offshore and it came onshore with the heavy waves uh, and broke up on the rocks just off the coast of Coronado. Now, this is 1938 and that ship, you can still see the outline of the hull. Why is that? Because the top structure built of wood was of course torn apart by the waves. This was a concrete hulled ship. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, its hull lasted a lot longer than the rest of the ship. And in fact, although this image is taken in 1938, on winter, very low tides, which we sometimes have, if you get to the area at just the right time, you can still see the outline of this concrete ship and the rocks offshore. Now, where is this? Well, let's get you oriented. Um, right now, this strip of land is occupied by very tall condominiums, which were built in the 1970s. So that's where the ship is offshore. Just out of sight here at the edge of the image, are the grounds of the Hotel Del Coronado. Now this particular photograph not only has the legacy of the Monte Carlo sinking, it also has the legacy of this area here. This was known as Tent City. And it was built when the Hotel Del Coronado underwent some renovations. They'd put up this temporary area of tents and buildings with some entertainment, some restaurants, and so, it became so popular that even after the renovations were done and the wealthiest people could afford to go back to the Hotel Dell, the middle class people continued to come out here on um, the summertime, especially to stay in the tents and enjoy being down by the sea. So Tent City, this is 1938. It would only last for another couple of years because um, we were gradually drifting into World War II and the land along this area was needed for military construction. So Tent City was uh, eventually torn down. But that's, that's legacy number two in this image. And here's legacy number three. It's just a little settlement right here. It's only eight acres in size. This is a camp of the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, one of many different alphabet agencies, they call them, that, that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt created when he was president during the Depression to help bring money to communities and give jobs to people out of work. And so in um, San Diego in particular and in Coronado, the Civilian Conservation Corps did things like building or maintaining sewer lines, helping with the uh, blacktop and asphalting of streets, um, just working on a variety of projects that took pure manual labor to do, but it gave jobs to people. So you've got three different legacies on this one image shared by the Coronado Historical Association. And speaking of Coronado, if you go into their library, you can see some more legacies of the past. The image up on the top, the black and white image, is the inside of the La Avenida Cafe. It was very popular in Coronado. And um, it was a place where people went for Mexican food and they went to enjoy the murals and the paintings that had been done by a renowned artist named Ramos Martinez. And so they were, some of them were painted directly on the walls of the cafe. Um, and when the uh, business, sort of slowed down during World War II and things were not good and the building got in disrepair and it was going to be torn down. And in the meantime, all these wonderful images were still inside and as the roof broke down, 
they were subject to rain and sun and uh, discussed or trying to rehabilitate at least the artwork started in about 1992. And it wasn't until the mid uh, 2000s that the Coronado Public Library redid its space and was able to bring in some of this Ramos mater uh, Martinez material. So the long mural behind the desk is the um, is the market day mural that Ramos Martinez did for the restaurant. It's 38 feet long. So if you get a chance to go in there, take a look at that. Take a look also below for this beautiful Canasta de Flores. Um, here is what it looked like when it was taken out of the restaurant. It had been subject to rain and wind and, and sun. And so the re restoration work um, took a long time, but it's been beautifully done. So something else for you to see over in Coronado. And finally, a third thing that you can see over in Coronado is some houses that were moved. You see, remember those lumber yards that were over on San Diego side of the bay? Lumber was really expensive because you had to pay for the transportation to get it down from the Northwest. It had to be milled here. Then it had to be moved to the place where the building was going on. And um, in many cases in San Diego, when it came time to either put in a new road or a new building or eventually to put in some of the highways, um, they needed to tear down some of the old buildings. And instead of tearing them down, they were moved. And so some were moved across San Diego Bay to Coronado. Um, others were moved across San Diego Bay in later years, but done a little bit differently. This one was actually, uh, it is now on a crane. It was divided into three parts. It's called the Baby Dell, um, but it was moved from Sherman Heights and moved over to Coronado. And it happens to be right next door to this one. So you have the Edwards house um, and this Baby Dell house right next door to each other on uh, a nice street that I'll remember the name of shortly. And um, so anyway, you can go visit these two sites. So lots of moving going on. The one that I wished I could have seen. Um, in 1905, there was a huge winter storm that just brought incredible wave action to the, the land along Ocean Boulevard, which is where many of the first big Victorian houses were built. Uh, in fact, um, the house that this Edwards house that was moved was moved away from Ocean uh, to another location. But a, a house for which I don't have an image was owned by a Dr. Needler. It was also on this Ocean Boulevard. It, uh, it was actually moved before the biggest storm of all. But get this how it was moved. They didn't put it up on a platform and haul it with a truck. They put it, they put it on a series of rounded logs and they laid it out and then horses pulled that whole house forward until they would then take the last logs move them around to the front make a place where the house could then continue to move forward and in this way of moving the logs and moving the house they finally even got it all the way across the main street of Coronado to the other side of the island where it sits, I believe, still today. So that's the Needler house. So moving houses over in Coronado was a pretty big thing. But we didn't just move things on the Coronado side of the bay. We also took advantage of locations and either sited buildings to take advantage of an older building or moved a building when it was in the way. And so the Western Metal Supply Company is a legacy from the, the business, Western Metal Supply Company, but today it is party rooms and seating. And I think down below there may be a, a, some sales uh, of Padre memorabilia, but this is a building that was in sight and the stadium was actually built up and around it. And so the yellow line that you see is the left field foul line located 336 feet from home plate. So that's Western Metal Supply, which was allowed to stay where it was. Another building had to be moved because if you've been to the Padre Ballpark, you know that there is a large area that's called Park in the Park. And the idea is that people can go there, pay a different fee to come in, sit on a blanket and have a picnic and let their kids run around in the grass while the ball game is going on. Um, so Park in the Park was created when they moved the Scholey Brothers Candy Factory about a block away so that it could be renovated, but it would then clear the land for park in the park. 
So if you have the opportunity to go to a Padre game, make sure you look for that big open space because that's where the Sholey Brothers Candy Company was located. Well, other things got moved in San Diego. The little building that you see in the upper left here was that emergency medical facility that I mentioned that the military had in Balboa Park during the 1915 and 16 exposition. So it was just a tiny little building. And uh, when the military eventually got its new Naval Hospital in 1923, this building was vacated and um, local organizations were allowed to use it until finally it was given over in its entirety to the Girl Scouts of San Diego County, which is a relatively new organization. And so this was Girl Scout headquarters for quite some time. And it was located along Park Boulevard where today there is a playground called the Pepper Grove. Um, and so this is the area that the Pepper Grove now occupies and it's right at the edge of the canyon. And if you look, stand and look over across the canyon, you'll be looking into sort of the back of the Japanese Friendship Garden. So it's a long park boulevard there. I think there still exists this roundabout when you go into the parking lots that were here. But here's this little structure. And of course, this was a tiny little building. And so in the 1930s, a wonderful benefactor by the name of Florence Burnham uh, gave the money so that a second building could be built on this site. And so an auditorium building was built here so that Girl Scouts would have the, the place to have bigger meetings. They could have luncheons. They, the girls could put on plays and have classes. So this was really the main location of Girl Scouts until the late 1950s. And that's the point at which the city of San Diego allocated some of the most, I would call it the Northern part of Balboa Park along Yupa Street. Part of it went to the Boy Scouts and part of it went to the Girl Scouts. And for the Girl Scouts, they already had this building down here and the city wanted to put in a playground. So the city said, okay, you gotta move your buildings and clean up the land and then we'll build the playground. Well, so they raised the money and they got the buildings moved. But when the architects and the city examined the buildings, not everything was able to be moved. So the little Naval Hospital could not be moved. It was so old, it could not be moved well. But the auditorium building did just fine. So they put the auditorium building in the parking lot of the Girl Scout headquarters. And right next to it, they put one of these long uh, buildings, the corridors, where there was storage material for Girl Scouts, camping gear and arts and crafts gear and homemakers gear, all the things that Girl Scouts learned to do in their activities. So it was a pretty odd looking building when it was uh, transferred over in, the, in about 1956 or so, but by the time it was finished, it looks like a pretty decent building. Although if you get inside and walk around it and look up into the roof rafters, you see some very unusual angles that nobody would build things that way way to begin with. But this is Florence Burnham Hall at Girl Scout headquarters. Now downtown, there was also some building went on. Um, this building was built in 1924. Um, it was called the Douglas Hotel, but it was home to what was known as the Creole Palace. Now 1924 is the height of the time when alcohol could not legally be sold in San Diego, but there certainly had nightclubs. And the nightclubs had wonderful costume dancers and high kick and can can and all sorts of things. This happens to be one of the black businesses, one of few black businesses that was downtown at the Creole Palace. Um, and so the workers that uh, were at the palace were the bartenders were black, the dancers were black, the, uh, for the most part, the constituents, the visitors, the, the guests were black, but not exclusively black. And did they have alcohol? Hmm, well, nobody knows. There were a lot of soft drinks sold, but who knows what was sold there, but it was a pretty popular place. So the Creole Palace was just at the edge of the gas lamp quarter at 2nd and uh, Market Street. Now, where did these people stay? They couldn't stay in the hotel because it was available for rental for other people. And so they moved to, they lived in a different site, which is about five blocks away. This is the Claremont Hotel, and you can see it's not the spelling of our Claremont up by me in University City, different spelling. This is the Claremont Hotel. It was a working man's hotel, if you would, but it was built on land that did not have the racially restrictive covenants 
that the rest of downtown had. And so they were able to build a place where Blacks could live. So this is where the, the dancers, the entertainers, and the workers in the hotel lived if they needed to live downtown. It is the only place so far that we're aware of that has been designated as a part of um, the Black community in San Diego. So this is its historical landmark. It is still operating as a working men's hotel today, um, but it is in pretty, pretty bad shape um, downtown. But it is located at 7th and about Market Street downtown. Another hotel building that's important in our history. This one was known as the Pacific Hotel um, in the days of the early gas lamp quarter. Um, then it became known as the Callan Hotel. Um, in the pre-World War II era, this building really marked the center of the Japanese American community uh, for business in San Diego. So today it's part of the gas lamp quarter, but back then it was the height of the of a Japanese community. So the Nippon Shokai Company, for example, was on the ground floor of the Pacific Hotel. And in these upper buildings, there was a, a Dr. Kateda, pardon me, Takeda, a dentist. Uh, there were Ken organizations. These are like uh, the old state picnic days, except these, the Kens were the political divisions from which Japanese emigrated. And so they had meeting rooms upstairs where they could get together and conduct business. Today, the only tangible evidence of the Japanese being in the gas lamp quarter pre-World War II is this language, this kanji at the bottom of the sign. That's the only remaining evidence of the Japanese having been in this area. So that's, this is your legacy to remind you that this was once a Japanese business district. Well, after the war, um, Japan made some overtures to resume relationships with uh, the United States. And one of the things that uh, was done was this, the city of Yokohama made a gift to the city of San Diego of a beautiful stone um, lantern, a friendship gift to the people of San Diego. But that Japanese business area was no longer located. There wasn't, there was no central district and the mayor and the city council members had no idea what to do with this beautiful gift, which they accepted from Japan. And so the, the, um, the, the San Diego Zoo stepped up and said, well, if you'd like, you can put it in a garden and we'll kind of see if we can make a garden around it. So today, today, if you go to the San Diego Zoo, you can still see this beautiful stone lantern came over in about 1954 as a gift from the people of Japan to the people of San Diego. Now the San Diego Zoo got involved in a slightly different way um, in eradicating um, something that was in San Diego. And thanks to um, a local uh, garden historian, Nancy Carroll Carter, I have this image of the aloe garden that Kate Sessions planted um, just outside. The buildings that you see here are part of the Spanish village. That's where the arts people now have outdoor uh, and indoor galleries and places to display their art and they have um, activities that go on there for kids. So this is the Spanish village. And this is the, the alignment of Park Boulevard um, after the 1935 exposition. So it went right along the Spanish village and it went right along the side of the, the exposition grounds. And so Kate Sessions built her agave garden and um, it was quite wonderful as Kate Sessions gardens tend to be, but the San Diego Zoo in the 1960s and 70s said, hey, we need more room for parking and city. We want you to realign Park Boulevard and we want you to move it so that we have an alignment farther away from the buildings so we can then create all this land for parking. And so the Agave, build, the agave Garden is no longer, but as a legacy, we do have photographs of it thanks to Nancy Carroll Carter. There's lots of legacies in Balboa Park in addition to the buildings. If you go inside the Casa del Prado, you can find pieces of some of the buildings and you can see for yourself that the plaster and water and straw was what these pieces were made out of. So this was called staff, this material that was built just to be temporary for the 1915 and 16 expositions. 
Now, if we go further north of Balboa Park along Park Boulevard, you will come to the community of University Heights. Um, and it has a lot of different legacies. Remember the little blip that I asked you to remember in the 1908 map? Well, if you consider, continue up Park Boulevard and you cross Park Boulevard, you come into an area that was known as Mission Cliffs Garden. And the history of it is that John D. Spreckles, the millionaire from Hawaii who then moved to San Francisco and then moved to San Diego Coronado, businessman who built trolley lines and he had built a trolley line up Park Avenue, Park Boulevard. And he wanted to be sure that there was something for people to see at the end of the line. So he had Mission Cliffs Gardens built. So he hired landscape architects to build this beautiful garden. Um, today, I think you can still see it's, I think it's empty, but there's a beautiful circular pond, which was once a lily pond up there. And one of the things that was moved from Coronado up to Mission Cliff Gardens was the Bentley ostrich farm. So some, again, so people would have something to see. So today in University Heights, you see the University Heights sign over Park Boulevard reminding us of the trolley, but look up at the top. That's not a bird standing there. That's a statue. It's a statue of an ostrich. And when you see the, um, the, the markers for the path through the trolley barn park, which is the former site of the trolley barn for the trolleys that used to go up and turn around uh, in the area next to Mission Cliff Gardens. Well, those are not just random rocks. Those are designed to look like ostrich eggs. So lots of reminders of the ostrich farm, the trolley. These are some of the original gates which still exist. And oh, look, a rock representing an ostrich egg up at the top. And finally, you have the dedication of the trolley car barn site as part of the park that was um, created from the area that uh, Spreckles had set aside for the maintenance. Down in the South Bay, there are some legacies that you can only see at very low tide, but the name remains and the name is the legacy. The legacy name is Gunpowder Point because during World War I, help, uh, kelp was harvested, hauled down to the South Bay, stored in 270 redwood vats until it was broken down into the material that then would be added to gunpowder. Today, it is the site of the Living Coast Discovery Center. There are walking trails through here. And if you go at a very low tide in the wintertime, you may be able to see some of the walls and vats that remain from the Hercules Powder Company plant that was located down here. And finally, two legacies along Park Boulevard. Um, these are legacies from when General Dynamics and, the, and Convair and the big aircraft plants were building uh, war material during World War II. These were built to aid people in crossing over from the trolley tracks to get to their jobs in the plants. Only two of them left. There were more of them during the day, but we have two of them left to remind us of this legacy of San Diego's past. And finally, just to remind you, always look up and look at street signs and look at what is the story that might be told by these street signs. They're actually in my community. Um, and Stresemann Street goes off to the right and Angel Street goes off the same direction to the left. So why the name change? There's probably a piece of history there. But there's another piece of history that relates to University City. University City came to be developed when the University of California was being built. And so we have a lot of streets that remind us of the presence of the university. We have Honors Court and we have Regents Road. Uh, even Governor Drive, I think, might get its name because of the, the structure of the um, ruling of the university at that time. But you also have a lot of names that are used. And Nobel gives you the answer to what are these legacies. All of these men were recipients of the Nobel Peace Prize, and that's why their names are on a street up in my community. So that is the end of my talk, but uh, I am happy to deal with any questions that you might have. And Sam, would you um, let me know if there's anything that I need to deal with here? 
Yeah, we have had a couple of really great comments in the chat, um, some connections folks are making. Um, Myra Herman shares with us that the City Parks and Rec Department received a grant from the state in 2020 to restore the 26th Street Trail and the Oak Grove for Benning, uh, Bennington Oak Grove. So that would be that. Um, and <laughs> shares that she conducted the environmental review of the Girl Scouts facility, the new Girl Scouts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is Myra <laughs> Herman. Myra did it. And Myra, I was on the other side of that. I don't know if you remember, but um, <laughs> I was very involved in that. Uh, we've got one question so far. Um, going back to your concrete inscriptions, um, there are some concrete inscriptions around uh, this person's neighborhood on the North Park side of Balboa Park. Um, and among them, there is one that says, never amiss with RNA. Any idea who or what is RNA? RNA, I recognize as the name of one of the many concrete companies. Um, so I suspect that that's, that might be what that is about. There's also a very interesting piece, and I've been working on it with the North Park Historical Society, and we cannot come up with why it might be there. But when I first went to Boundary Street to look at the curb um, cuts, the, the curb sidewalk marks there, and I was looking at the curbs very carefully, and there is an inscription in the curb just south of University Avenue and on Boundary Street, and there's arrows pointing right and left, and in the middle is the word Pueblo. And that is the marker of the Pueblo division line. But it's, I walked the entirety of Boundary Street now. I have not found another reference to Pueblo. So it may be that somebody did it on their own and it was not a, uh, an official marking. But I thought it was kind of neat to find. That's fascinating. Like, so we've got to look up and down, right, Linda? Up and down and all around. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, hopefully a couple of questions might come through here. We've got some activity in the chat um, saying thank you and things like that. Um, we've got a couple more minutes for questions. If you've got them, please go ahead and use the Q&A function. Um, or if you've got anything else to share or to say, you can pop it into the chat. And while yeah, you- and uh, If you know of a legacy, if you know of a legacy, something that is a remnant of the past that is just kind of here, you know, um, there's there's lots of them, and I had a lot to choose from. So um, just please drop uh, drop Sam a line at the History Center, and um, she'll get that information to me, and I'll check it out. Absolutely. Um, we've got a question coming up that asks if your slides will be available after the presentation, and I can answer that with a link to our YouTube channel, um, because that is where you will find all of our past presentations. So I'm going to drop that into the chat, and uh, that is where you can find, you can view this again if you like. Uh, her slides themselves will not be available, but you can see the presentation again. And I will give you that link in just a second while I ask this question of you, Linda, any information on Campo Street in Rolando? <laughs> oh, I wish I had a few paragraphs to fill you in on, but you know what? I absolutely do not have anything to, to share with you about Campo. Um, to me, it sounds like a name, um, but, uh, but I don't know. And I will, I will see what I can find out. All right. So let me go ahead and put that link in the chat for you folks. This one here that I'm dropping is the YouTube channel. So this one will take you to all of our past presentations, all of our San Diego 101s, our um, other webinar series that we have done in the past couple of years. Um, and you can get to all of those links from there. I'm also going to share some other links that might interest you if this piqued your interest and um, you've got more questions or if you want to see us again. Um, our San Diego 101 series will continue. Uh, we're going to be back next second Tuesday of the month, so October 12th, with a presentation on the San Diego River. And I'm going to drop the link to that registration, as well as to our events page, our collections page, um, if you're interested in education and programs and all those things like that, while we get some maybe some last questions before we say goodbye. So all that info is for you there, along with our YouTube channel. And you can come and see us in person as well. We are open um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Balboa Park uh, at the San Diego History Center and Saturday and Sunday at in Presidio Park at the Junipero Serra Museum. So you can visit us at both locations as well as online. 
Any last questions before we say goodbye to Linda? Or comments? Oh, Myra also shares that um, she's got city oversight uh, slash responsibility for archaeological excavations at Petco Park and throughout downtown for many years. That's a fantastic connection. Some comments on, let's see. I'm not sure quite what this is, but there's a comment about um, there being a lot of Spanish surname signs in the sidewalks of North Park. Um, not really sure what that's, what the um, could That could relate. Remember I mentioned that street names got changed as they were realigning to match up with the larger subdivisions or roads that appear to be through roads. And um, often street signs were put right in the sidewalks. And so that could be a former name of a street that, that now you know as something else. Um, so that's a possibility. Oh, okay. Oh, I think I'm, um, there might be some typo here. So maybe thinking about the fact that um, people with Spanish surnames may not have been able to own a home in North Park, um, but the uh -huh. names are related on the, on the sidewalk, which is an interesting um, observation. Uh, that I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a comment one way or the other. Don't just don't know. Okay, um, it looks like that's the last of our questions. Some thank yous and some um, nice comments coming in on the chat for you, Linda. Um, but other than that, it looks like we've reached the end of our question. So we're going to go ahead and stop. And if you've got anything that comes to you after, you're welcome to email education at sandiegohistory.org, and I will pass your questions along to Linda and see what we can find out for you. Or you can go and do your own research on our website as well. That's that link up uh, that I shared a few uh, comments ago. Thank you folks so much, and we'll see you next month. Thank you all. Good to see you.